Hey there, it's Gary Parish. It's Monday, February 14th, 2022. Welcome back to the CBS Sports I Own College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. And if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, smash the like button like your brain. Day. It's Valentine's Day, for crying out loud. No better, no better day to smash than Valentine's Day. So go <laughs> I think that's probably true. So go smash that <laughs> like button like your Brandon Davies. And if you're not subscribed already, please knock that out as well. All right, Dead Lag, I want to start with a couple of Left Coast programs, two programs you've written about over the past week because both won this weekend uh, with few issues. Gonzaga beat St. Mary 74-58. Arizona beat Washington 92-68. So now Mark Few and Mark Few's longtime assistant, Tommy Lloyd, are a combined 43-4. and on the season before we get to the zags please yeah. enlighten us um as your saturday column did mm. on how rare it is for a first year coach to be as successful as tommy lloyd is being this season at arizona uh happy valentine's day buddy happy valentine's day happy, yeah. you actually th- and uh, you threw me i got thrown for a quick loop i'm <laughs> I don't know why I thought this, but I lit- I don't know. Uh, my In my brain, when we, when you logged on here for this podcast, I thought you were going to be in New York City, but you're flying later today. Yes. You're not, you not there yet. I uh, Listen, I'm just twisted. Um, my wife, God bless her. She's like, you know what? Just go and get me flowers. Uh, just get an assortment, and that's all you need to do for me. That's that's fine. I did a little something else on the side. But anyway, this morning, I, I had to get it done before we podcast, so I show up to this florist, and my man, oh, my goodness. 30 guys in that thing. Oh, 30 no, guys. No. And I got back in time for this podcast. But I like Super Bowl Sunday. It just, I don't know. Things got away from me. Um, I'm rocking my Umphreys McGee winter hat. And apparently they played in Connecticut a few nights ago. And two different guys in there are like, dude, were you at the show? Were you at the show? I was not. I do love me some Umphreys. Was not at the show. And so, like, they want to they want to be talking about, like, you know, the set list and their bluten cat and all this stuff. Like, seven people know what I'm referencing. Anyway, the point is, I was in such a squeeze. I was like, well... At least GP will be good to go because he's in New York City and then you're not. You're at home. So anyway, I, I've been hoping you got to understand. And these aren't even sponsors. Perhaps they should be um, flowers dot com. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cherries, berries. I know. You, you just one night you're sitting around two weeks ago watching basketball. You do the online order. It'll arrive on February 14th. And um, you saved. Now you, you do have to pay a little bit more. You know, yeah. it's going to cost you a little bit more. But, <laughs> but how much? How much extra money would you pay this morning to not have to do that this morning? That's a fair point. Although I did, you know, I go to this florist. I'd never been to this spot before. It's a, it's a great spot. Big, you know, actually a sizable building for a florist. I got to be honest. And uh, and so <laughs> and they like I picked all the flowers and then the bill comes up. I'm like. We, sh- we sure about that? We sure about that price there? And uh, yeah, sure enough, you know, it's accurate. Very, ac- very accurate. Um, but happy Valentine's Day to everyone listening. Happy Valentine's to GP. And uh, and here we are. We are off and and rolling on a rare Monday morning podcast. Yes, that's right. So anyone that came uh, came by that can't get to Sunday episodes, welcome to a Monday AM show. As for your question off the top with Arizona. So this is going to be a trivia time for the listeners at home because I know GP already knows this because it was in my column. If you haven't read my column, you won't know the answer. So play along at home. Trivia time for the listeners is this, and I will tell you the answer at the end of the segment. Uh, Tommy Lloyd right now has a a team that is number two in multiple metrics, both predictive and results-based. Uh, Arizona has a great shot as we speak right now at getting a number one seed. They rolled Washington over the weekend, 192 to 68. And with a 22 and two record right now, Arizona's in a really good spot. And I think what Tommy Lloyd's doing here is up for legitimate consideration for national coach of the year. Obviously he'd be on the short list, but if he can get Arizona, to the one line on Selection Sunday, which we are now less than a month away from, by the way. We are less than a month away from Selection Sunday. He would become just the third coach in history to get a number one seed in his first season as a head coach, period. Not first season with a program. No, first season ever as a head coach. Only two other people have done it. You can play along internally. I'll let, I'll let you know who the other two people were in just a little bit here. So Arizona, at this point, I know you don't have them second overall but the my column basically said Arizona has a very convincing case to be a top two team in the sport right now because of what they've been able to do if you look at the metrics right now they are fourth uh in Torvik 
but they are second in Ken Palm. They were second in the net as of yesterday. They obviously still are. So second in the net, second in strength of record, second in Ken Palm, second in Sagarin, second in BPI. They are uh, fourth in KPI, and they are fourth at Torvik. So Arizona has a viable case. The only two losses on the road, Tennessee, UCLA. Not only are those ranked, they were ranked teams when they played them, ranked teams now, viable, you know, comfortable, high-seeded NCAA tournament teams. Uh, t- what Tommy Lloyd's been able to do has been outstanding. I don't want to say it's been overlooked, Paris, because it has not been overlooked. I mean, damn, I just wrote a, a, a damn column about it over the weekend. But at this point, I, I would have Tommy Lloyd National Coach of the Year. I say this as someone who's going to go see another prime candidate for that on Tuesday night with Ed Cooley. I see what Bruce Pearl has done. But because Tommy Lloyd just became a head coach, just took over this program, has his team sitting on the one line, and per more metrics than not, the second best team in the sport to Gonzaga, I would have him, again, this is ever so narrowly, narrowly ahead of Bruce Pearl and then ahead, ahead of Ed Cooley. But uh, what he's done there has been well beyond expectation last point here because I think it can sometimes um, be easy just to think like, Oh yeah, well, you know, they were going to have a good team had a good roster. This team wasn't that great last season when they had Sean Miller and they had the, the, the postseason ban and they were not a a ranked group heading into the season. They were expected to be good top three, top four in the pac 12, but not top five in the country. Good. What Tommy Lloyd's been able to do with this roster, with this talent uh, to, you know, get Arizona back in the mix of national relevance. Top five status is pretty awesome. They did finish 29th at Ken Palm last season under Sean Miller. Um, I, I, I think we've talked about this before. They were a good team last season. We just never discussed them really or focused on them much because they weren't going to play in the NCAA tournament. And so they I don't want to say they were off people's radar, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about teams that aren't going to the NCAA tournament. Um, but they did finish 29th, and then they returned um, Azulis Tabellas. Ben Matherin, Kirk Risa, Christian Coloco. They returned five of their top nine scores. Um, they added a transfer from Gonzaga and obviously added a new coaching staff. And they have been terrific. Like, it's wild to think that this team could also have James Akinjo, who, of course, after last season, transferred to Baylor and has been one of Baylor's key players uh, this season. You're right that they have a case to be top two in the country. Um, I have them fourth right now behind Gonzaga, Auburn, Kentucky, and Arizona. And if somebody were asking me to justify that, um, I, I I think Auburn can you can still argue has the best resume in the country. I mean, they're seven and two in quadrant one, six and zero oh in quadrant two, thirteen and two inside the first two quadrants. That is better. Um, really, it's better than everybody in the country based on pure resume. Um, you could argue reasonably that Auburn still has the best resume in the country, even after last week's overtime loss at Arkansas. Auburn remains the only team in the country that hasn't lost in regulation. Um, but Gonzaga's computer numbers at this point are so strong that I did elevate after Auburn lost Gonzaga to the number one spot in the top 25 and one. So I've got it one Gonzaga, two Auburn, and then three Kentucky, four Arizona. And There's no getting around the fact that Arizona probably does have a better raw resume than Kentucky. I mean, Arizona is six and two in the first quadrant, five and oh in quadrant two, so eleven and two in the first two quadrants. Whereas Kentucky's five and four in quadrant one, four and oh in quadrant two, so nine and four in the first two quadrants. If I were trying to justify them, why Kentucky over Arizona at this point? Um, I think they've got better wins, like an 18 point win at Kansas. Kentucky has that. An 11 point win at Alabama. Kentucky has that. Kentucky's also 14 and two in the past 16 games. And the two losses are at LSU and at Auburn. And they lost a starter in both of those games. They lost Xavier Wheeler against LSU. They lost Ty Ty Washington against Auburn. So um, Kentucky's only lost twice this season when Xavier Wheeler and Ty Ty Washington both start and finish the game and again that 18 point win at kansas is massive but this isn't something i would have a uh, more than a 30 second argument about with anybody if you want to have arizona anywhere from two to four i think it's totally reasonable which underlines uh, i think your larger point um, at this moment they're headed for a one seed in the ncaa tournament and i keep hearing people say oh gonzaga arizona 
That's going to be some West Regional final. If they can both keep this up, they're not both going to be in the West Regional. They're both going to be one seed somewhere else. Uh, I thought about that very thing. Yes, Arizona is, is clearly tracking toward um, basically getting into a, a battle with Gonzaga about who would be the number one seed in the West. And, and w- you know, if Arizona can win out, asking a lot. I don't think it's going to win out. Uh, road games remaining at Utah, at Colorado, at USC. Uh, home games remaining against or- the Oregon schools and then Stanford and Cal. Then we get to the Pac-12 tournament. Arizona is almost certainly going to take at least one more loss. Two might even be reasonable at this point. And I don't think it'll be more than that. Um, but if it gets to selection Sunday with just three, uh, three loss, Arizona team versus a Gonzaga team that wins out with two losses would actually be fascinating from a resume perspective because Gonzaga did not play a road game in non-conference play. It's going to actually, because of the way the schedule broke against Gonzaga in league play, like Gonzaga, I think a lot of people realize this Gonzaga is only going to play 14 WCC regular season games. Normally it will play 16. It's the two it's going to lose are both winnable, but they're on the road. I can't remember which ones they are. Um, they might be uh, Pacific. Anyway, they're both road games. So the point is they're going to lose two more road games. So when the committee is looking at, okay, uh, we got to split hairs here between what teams are getting on the one line and what teams aren't and where we're going to ship them. Gonzaga is not going to have as many road opportunities, road wins, non-conference road games that could ultimately wind up, you know, giving Arizona the, if again, Arizona has got to get there with two or three losses, probably to beat out a Gonzaga team that doesn't lose. Um, But if that were to happen, then, you know, you want the West region if you're Arizona and Gonzaga. So that would be interesting. They could also end up one, two in the same region. That's not unthinkable. Obviously, that would be quite the storyline uh, that none of those men want. Mark Few and Tommy Lloyd don't want to face each other in the NCAA tournament, particularly in the first year where they're not on the same coaching staff together. Uh, but we'll see. Again, we have a month to get there. Uh, we will get a little bit of a peek into this this upcoming weekend. And we'll talk about this on Friday show. The once a year, you know, it's not even midseason. We're now less than a, a month away to Selection Sunday. Top 16 reveal on CBS will be Saturday at 1230. The Selection Committee is meeting this week, and it will you know, figure out a top 16. I'm going to talk to the chair, uh, uh, Tom Burnett, of this year's committee, and there will be something on the site later this week in advance of that. But the point is, we'll see where they decide, decide to ship both of these teams because Gonzaga plays Wednesday at Pepperdine. Figure that's going to be a win. They'll probably be the one in the West. Arizona does not play again until after the committee is done meeting. They play home against Oregon State. If they were to lose that, I guess they might make a, a late second change. But I think they decide that, GP, on uh, on Thursday nights. As for Tommy Lloyd, real quick, just on, on the whole, what he has been able to, to do and accomplish here uh, from a historical standpoint, he is going to have a really good chance. 22 wins right now. Here are the only coaches to win 30 games in their first year as a head coach. Bill Guthridge at North Carolina, Bill Hodges at Indiana State, Brad Underwood at Stephen F. Austin, Steve Prome at Murray State, Jamie Dixon went 31 and 5 in 2004, his first year as a head coach at Pitt. First year as a head coach, period. Brad Stevens did it his first year as a head coach at Butler, won 30 games. And then Stan Heath won 30. He got there because he made the Elite Eight in 2002. John Warren in Oregon. Of course, you remember John Warren. 1945 uh, played a 43 game season, went 30 and 13. Those are the only head coaches to win 30 in their first year. Tommy Lloyd, I think, is going to do this. Now, as for the trivia time, the answers I just mentioned them the only head coaches to get a one seed in their first season as a head coach Guthridge at North Carolina, who uh, what, just went 34 and four, was the national Naismith coach of the year, got a one seed and took Carolina to the final four, uh, inheriting the roster from Dean Smith. But, but that's, that is an all timer. And then Bill Hodges had Larry Bird after serving, serving as an assistant at ISU. Uh, he went undefeated into the NCAA tournament and made the title game without a loss, finished 33 and one. ISU, of course, lost to. Irvin Johnson and Michigan State in that uh, epic classic all-timer 79 championship game. So those are the only two to get a one seed. The NCAA began conventionally seeding the field in 79. So they technically seeded the field in 78, but it, the way they did it was a really wonky, and I didn't even consider that because it was between automatic bids and at larges. So the way we know the field to be seeded started in 79. Only two coaches have done it. Parrish, yes or no? Tommy Lloyd will become the third in less than a month. Yes. Agreed. Uh, because, um, A, because I just think they're they're good enough to do it. Um, but B, I don't know how many legitimate, you know, loss opportunities are on the schedule. You know, they, they've already played UCLA twice. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I think they're going to roll through the rest of this. I mean, they might take a loss somewhere, but I think they're going to, they're going to be fine. And, and, and they're going to end up with a one seed. Um, if you wanted to nitpick them a little bit and I, I'm not really interested in it, but like, you know, they, they beat Michigan with like the big wins are Michigan, Illinois, UCLA, USC, um, beat Michigan when Michigan was a mess, uh, beat an Illinois team that, you know, for whatever reason, loses often. Um, they split with UCLA, um, and then they beat a USC team that hasn't really beaten anybody other than UCLA. Yeah. So, like, I, I don't know that Arizona can match the other elite teams in the country for top line wins. I mean, I know, I know that they they got six quadrant one wins, but I just, I just told you what the best of them are, and you can all, you can just. As we've noted many times, all quadrant one wins aren't the same. And um, so if you wanted to nitpick them, that's the place to start. But I, I, this team's great. They're, they're one of only two teams in the country, top 10 in both offensive and defensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm. They play fast. Um, they're, they're, they're experienced. Um, and Tommy's the goods, it looks like. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we also talk about this all the time. Like, you and I have known Tommy for a long time and always assumed he would be a head coach someday, presumably at Gonzaga when Mark uh, stepped away. But when Arizona comes calling and, you know, Mark's retirement is nowhere in sight, you know, at, you know, mid to late forties, uh, there's no way you pass on that opportunity. So he took it understandably. So, and then it's like, now we get to see if you can do the job, you know, like great assistants don't always make great head coaches. There's a long list of them who have not been successful that on paper look like they absolutely would be. Uh, but Tommy has knocked this thing out of the park from from the jump. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not too in the weeds about how the Arizona uh, fan base or Arizona former players feel about him. But, you know, the former players, they were pushing for a former player. Um, when when the coaching search to replace Sean Miller was underway, and they weren't all thrilled with Arizona reaching outside of its quote family, um, but I would just assume, as we sit here today, um, they're all on board now because they've uh, they've got one of the best teams in the country, and it's sort of wild to think about. But there is a scenario, and I'm not predicting this, but there is a scenario where the longtime Gonzaga assistant wins a national championship mm. before Gonzaga as a program wins a national championship. Again, I'm not predicting it. I'm just right. saying it's very much as of February 14, 2022, it's very much on the table. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's a chance we might be discussing that kind of storyline as we get into the NCAA tournament. Again, we'll see how uh, pieces fall where they may. I know you mentioned off the top talking about the the two uh, dominant teams out on the left coast and Gonzaga being the other one there. Uh, Gonzaga just, you know, <laughs> they destroy state. I'm not surprised they won by as many as they did. I mean, they bet, I think they hit just about the line, Parrish, in that game. They won by 16, 74, 58. That's what I it wanna, was. It was the line 16? Yeah. I mean, it's just just a joke there um i did a piece on chet holmgren late, late last week for cbssports.com and then drew timmy oh by the way goes out and you know I, it, timmy has a way of of having these performances and just reminding everyone of uh of how good he can be and the fact that like timmy had 25 and 8 with five assists in that game against saint mary's um and it's just the way that Gonzaga plays. It just, it comes so naturally. Like if Timmy wanted more than 30, he could have had it in that game there. And so I just keep coming back to with Gonzaga. I'll go with this wherever you, wherever you want. But I, the thing I kept coming, coming back with Gonzaga is not just that. Yeah, here we go again. Like, you know, one of the best teams in the country, if not the best team in the country. Um, they just can beat you in so many different kinds of ways. And they don't even need... You know, the, selfishly, when you when you dedicate so much time into writing like a feature, you prefer the subject to, you know, then uh, go out and be awesome like the next game and the game after that game after that because it draws more attention. to It validates what you did. But I didn't expect it from Chet Holmgren. He had been awesome leading up to it. And that's why we timed it. to go. It was like, all right, it's finally time to uh, to take the lid off this story and kind of put it out there. But Chet Holmgren didn't need that even to have a good a big game. And he, he, they don't need him to. That's the other thing. And it's, it's kind of um, what I hit on in that story. The very fact that Chet Holmgren can be 
a threat to have a 25, 12, and 5 kind of night actually makes Gonzaga that much more daunting to prepare uh, for and play against. It, Chet Holmgren can have nights where he doesn't do any of that stuff, frankly. And they didn't need him to do it against St. Mary's, which is one of the best teams they're going to play this season. Holmgren finished with 11 points, 13 boards, and 3 blocks. And it was more than enough. He had an okay game for his standards. Uh, Nemhard was good. Timmy was absolutely awesome. Gonzaga runs away with it again, and they are number one in your rankings and number one across the board in every predictive metric. Um, yeah, the Zags are now 21-2 and two overall, 10-0 and 0 in the West Coast Conference. They're winning their league games by nearly 30 points per game. Um, before the St. Mary's game, it was above 30 points per game. They had won five straight by at least 30. They're just overwhelming everybody. And... I know that it's very easy for folks to to say, well, if you know, it's just the West Coast Conference, but like there's some good teams in there that they are absolutely destroying. And then don't ever forget, you know, as they do every year, they got some real work done in November and December. They uh, beat Texas by 12 points in November. That's a Texas team that's got some really nice wins. They beat UCLA by 20 points in November. They beat Texas Tech by 14 points in December. So they don't just have double-digit wins over good West Coast Conference teams. They've got double-digit wins over one of the best teams in the Pac-12, over two of the best teams in the Big 12. Um, and, and they have pulled away in you know, most of, of, of the computer rankings. And their um, adjusted efficiency margin, according to Ken Palm, is significantly better than anybody else is in the country. Like it's not, it's not even they're, close. They're like six points ahead or something like that right now. Yeah. I, I think it's closer to five, but it's in that yeah. range. Yeah. And you know, let me put a number on it for you. It's plus three, four point six, six second. The country's Arizona at plus two, nine point seven one. So I guess it's a little less than five right now. It was above five heading into the weekend and the plus three, four point six, six is um, actually higher than the plus 33.87 that Baylor finished with last season after it won the national title. So as I wrote in Monday morning's top 25 and one at this point, um, I'm assuming that the Zags are going to stay number one the rest of the season. I don't think they're going to lose again. Um, they're massive favorites in their next game, double digit favorites in the next two. And then at St. Mary's, according to Ken Palm project as an eight point winner, um, they'll be double digit favorites in every game in the West Coast Conference tournament that they play. Um, you know, they've won 31 straight West Coast Conference games dating, you know, back a ways. Um, at this point, anything other than a number one seed would be shocking. And they're about to be a number one seed um, for the third straight NCAA tournament. And it would be fourth straight NCAA tournament if we would have had a tournament in 2020. This stupid pandemic screwed that up. Yeah, we keep coming back to that, don't we? It's this is just so dumb. I know. Idiotic. But we're getting, not only are we, are we less than a month of Selection Sunday, for the most part, knocking on all the wood right now, for the most part, this will be the first normal NCAA tournament since 2019. 2019! Virginia wins in Minneapolis. Last time we had a normal NCAA tournament, we are mostly there. We actually got word that you know there's going to be press conferences a lot of there will not be you know this is way you know way inside baseball but there won't be locker room access which is a very helpful thing in the final four but there will be press conferences that you know coaches and players will attend media will attend we'll ask questions so there a lot of it is returning to normal uh but yes we're finally getting back to the place where we are uh we there are, yeah. there are still some schools that are not doing in-person press conferences like yeah, i don't I think know. I, I like, I still don't think Kentucky's doing anything in person. Right. Um, you know, I was talking to Jerry Tipton, the Kentucky media legend, uh, a few weeks back. And like, I, I think he wasn't traveling to some games because what are you gaining? You know, you're not sitting near the court. You don't get to talk to anybody in a way that is not provided to you on your computer. You know, everything's Zoom. So, like, what is the point? So, not everybody is back to normal, but like you said, um, we should have a, a fairly normal NCAA tournament, which is sneaking up on us. Like, it, like it's, it's well, mid-fit. Well, it, yeah. These seasons fly by. I mean, like I'm, I'm, I think I'm exhausted all the time, 
but these things fly by like it feels like it just started the other day and we're like you know a few weeks from selection sunday does that feel that way to you not necessarily but i i completely understand with what you're saying now i think a small part of this a small part of it is the fact that the nfl pushed back its season by one week i mean we're not the super bowl has never ended this late into february before where you know you know most of the sports world is going to talk about rams over Bengals here and and oh by the way uh Good game, but um, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It was a, it was a good game. I felt like when that game ended last night, just as an, as an aside, it felt more casual than any Super Bowl end of game scenario over the past twenty years. Like normally, it's a mob scene. It's going crazy. It just felt like it felt like they won in week fifteen. Maybe I'm off on this. Like Aaron Donald was emotional. OBJ was crying. Like I get all that, but like from a I don't know. There was something weird about that game. I think, I think oh, halftime I, was awesome. Yeah. I think the weird thing is that the Rams are the Super Bowl champions. Nobody cares about the Rams. <laughs> like nobody loves them, you know? Also true. Yeah. Like who loves them? In LA, they don't love them. I and know. that might be Louis, part of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they moved and yeah, I think that I think that is it. It's like who loves this team? Like if the Bengals would have won, like there are people who love that franchise and have been through hell. You know, like if the Bills would have gotten there yeah. and won, like the real passion for that team. There's no passion for the Rams, is there? It's a bunch of guys. Like it's a bunch of guys that like, just, hey, let's go get um, uh, uh, Von Miller and let's go get uh, Matt Stafford and let's go yeah. get. They just added some like pieces and did put together the best team in football. But like you don't. It's not, is that like that there's any Rams? Like no Rams fan in L.A. has been a Rams fan for the past ten years. And they didn't grow up watching Matt Stafford. He just got there. I mean, I think that to me, that's the best explanation for why it felt different and looked different is because it is different. Uh, true. Uh, I hope we, by the way, get a final four in that building. Looks really cool on TV. Um, so I would, I would think that we're going to, although it is open air and I don't know if that stuff will factor in and it shouldn't, but it is I think it's technically an open air stadium. But uh, but anyway, what was I saying? Oh, because the uh, because the Super Bowl is this late in the season for the first time ever, um, we look up, it's done, and yeah, we are less than a month away to Selection Sunday, and it is it is absolutely cruising. We are getting there uh, again. They'll have the in season, which they push back a week. The top sixteen reveal, and normally would have been this past weekend, more than a month from Selection Sunday. But because the NFL pushed its season, the NCAA decided we wanted to wait for football to be over before we did that. So. There is all of that. Anyway, okay, you want to uh, you want to tour the weekend, my man? Yeah, we'll get to some other interesting results from the weekend next. But first, a word from our sponsors. Go, go, go. Cue it. Cue it. Cue it. Hit the button. Kanata says we don't have the videos this week, so we're not doing it. <laughs> Seems like something I should have known about. Welcome back to the podcast, Parrish. What happened around the sport this week? Kansas rallied late to beat Oklahoma on America's most watched network, Network of Stars. Houston lost back-to-back -back games for the first time since 2017. Baylor beat Texas, <laughs> but lost Jonathan Chamwachachua for the season to a devastating knee injury. Providence apparently got lucky again. Beat DePaul in overtime. Now 21 and 2. USC got past UCLA. Rutgers won at Wisconsin to inch a little closer to the bubble. Michigan State wrecked the 5G in Indiana. 15 point win over the Hoosiers. Marquette lost at Butler. Dead leg. Take that wherever you want while I sit here and daydream about our sponsor. <laughs> He sent it, by the way, six minutes ago. He did give us the heads up. In the you can, dude, you can't send anything once this podcast starts. I'll never That's see it. Amazing. I'm, I'm focused amazing. on what I'm doing. Uh, I not, only thing, I can't be looking at notes once the podcast starts. So should you? Should, should, should. Just incredible. Okay. Uh, you listed off a whole bunch of games, but I was completely lost on all that. So, okay. Um, one thing I don't think you mentioned, I'm just going to mention a weekend winner. Uh, Colorado State went 2-0, beat Fresno State and Boise State to get 20-3. That was big time. So uh, Nico Medved's got his Rams in a great spot. Heading into March, so good on them. Notre Dame won by 15 at Clemson. Uh, the Irish, 14-2 in their past 16 games. 
in the tournament as of today, I would think uh, with some room to spare and 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 good on the ACC to have a couple teams kind of start to emerge here. UNC also got a um, a win to continue building uh, a tournament resume that will obviously still need some more work. How about USC though, GP? So it gets a home win over UCLA, 67-64. Drew Peterson out of the woodwork. This dude had the most surprising out of nowhere performance maybe of any player in a power conference this season. 27 points, 12 rebounds, five blocks, four assists. Oh, by the way, Andy Enfield is 5-0 and against Mick Cronin. Yes. Well, we may have to start reconsidering our very stance and philosophical beliefs about one Mick Cronin. Enfield's not lost to him. Oh, I know. No, we, we will never, okay. ever reevaluate Mick Cronin. What we might do is put Andy and Amanda's name on mm. the court at Pauley Pavilion. I have. Someone sent me this last year. I don't think it's on my other computer. Uh, where they sent a, photo, a Photoshop of Andy and Amanda Enfield and Nell and Nell Wooden. It was all of them. It was all I have that I have that image somewhere. But I, uh, Amanda, like the first week anybody ever heard of Andy Enfield, like you could not get Amanda off television. I haven't seen her in a while. That's a fair point. I would I would agree. But uh, but she's when's still the, there. She when's the, the last game? time you put your eyes on Amanda Enfield? It's it's been a while. It's been a while. I wonder how I, she's it's, doing. It's uh. It's been a while. Boy, she um, was a star in that NCAA she tournament. She was. By the way, quick side note: I forgot to bring this up earlier, and we'll get as I'm as I'm uh, as I'm getting the flowers this morning. Like I'm at a I'm, I'm at a florist, and then I go next door. There's a CVS, and I get a, I get a card. Okay, so I got the wedding band, and all the all this stuff. There's a woman there. Mm -hmm. She goes, "Do you happen to be buying a card for anyone?" Am I? I I'm I'm is it was I was I being hit on by a woman at a CVS? In the card aisle, as I'm clearly looking for a Valentine's card, maybe she's by herself. She was trying to get it in on Valentine's Day. Dead on? leg, dead leg. What's going on with this? Dead leg. I was like, yeah, you know, got to get getting one for for my wife and and the kids. And she's like, oh, that's wonderful. And and then you know, I kind of got it and left. But I was like, what's going on here right now? CVS on a Monday morning. I've never been hit on at a CVS on a Monday morning or on. It was any, the first at, for me at any time. I don't think I've ever been hit first on at a CVS. Then was kind of thrown by it. I'm minding my own business. She did the she did the sidle. Just probably making some casual conversation. Nothing wrong with it. I welcome it. But I, on, on Valentine's Day of all days, though. So you ever see those receipts they give you at CVS? Like 40 feet long. I feel like they've gotten better at that. But I told them to keep the receipt when I, I just Yeah, I, I always I say cards when I was out there. Yeah, and then and then sometimes the, the people working there, they're sweet. They're doing they're they're doing they're trying their heart's in a good place. But I'll be like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't need the receipt. You can keep that. And they'll say, oh, but it's got coupons on it. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna lose that before I ever use the coupons. Yeah. Like the uh, the idea that I'll hang on to this piece of paper. Oh, I've done this to myself. Yeah. No, I like when I go to the Stop and Shop here. And Stop and Shop is our primary grocer here. The shop is having big wide shouts to eat. But like, you'll check out the automatic checkout, and then it'll it'll give you like three or four coupons. I'm like, oh, I gotta take these. No, I don't. I'm never using them. I've got like 17 unused coupons in my car. What am I doing? Every time I'm like, what am I? I'm not. I got nothing against them, but I just I, I don't I just I need to get in and out of the store. Like I'm not I'm not messing around. Yeah, like like the idea that I'm going to pull into a CVS and be like, I need deodorant today. Let me pull out my deodorant coupon. Like this is not the way I operate. Yeah, I'm always true. on the fly with everything I do. So. Yeah, it's just a way. And then at Walgreens, boy, they drive me crazy. Oh, Again, yeah. heart's in the right place. But every time you walk in, they're like under orders to scream. Welcome to Walgreens. They don't have that here. Welcome to Walgreens. <laughs> okay. Hey, how you doing? It's like, and then you got to say, hey, thank you. Thank you for welcoming me to Walgreens. I'm just here to get something because my head hurts. Welcome to Walgreens. Stop it already. I don't need again. Heart's in the right place, but <laughs> cut it out. Anyway, getting, I'm getting some flack in the comments. Trust me. C congrats. On I, was staying, getting, I was I was getting hit on. All right. Congrats. So more than just that. Yeah. Congrats on staying loyal to your wife this morning at Walgreens. CVS. CVS. I apologize. Never, never in doubt. Never in doubt. Um, around the weekend. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jonathan Chamochachua out for the season. Baylor gets an impressive home win over Texas, 80 to 63. Uh, really impressive wire to wire performance by the Bears. 
But losing Chama Chachua, I mean, Scott Drew's team has just had injury issue after injury issue after injury issue. And yet you look up, team's still in a good spot. Now, big picture, what's going to happen down the road? I don't know. Does this stuff eventually add up? It feels like yes, but Baylor's 21 and four top five team in multiple predictive metrics here sitting at nine and three in the big 12 and still has a shot because it got the win against Texas still has a shot at winning the big 12. Uh, Kansas is one game ahead in the loss column at nine and two Jayhawks got a good push, got a good push at fog Allen from Oklahoma, which really put up a, a quite a, a nice performance. If it hadn't gone ice cold for like a seven minute stretch late in the second half, Sooners might have been able to uh, to pull it off, but they didn't. But yes, that's the the big injury news from the weekend was losing everyday John, which is obviously um, which is obviously a problem. And oh, by the way, in the Big Twelve, uh, West Virginia lost by twenty three at Oklahoma State. It, it's now fourteen and ten. I, talk about how the Big Twelve is going to get seven eight teams in the tournament. I, West Virginia is plummeting, dude. I, I don't know. West Virginia is fourteen and ten. Iowa State's probably going to get there, but it's sixteen and nine and three and nine in the league. Like. Big 12's last place team is going to get a nut large bit, I think, because Iowa State still has the the res. It still ha- it objectively still has the resume. Now, you and I are both in agreement that loss volume has to count. So, at a certain point, if Iowa State continues to lose, then we got to have a real conversation. But I'd still have them in there. It's just the Big 12, the bottom half of it's it's shaken up in a in a funky way right now because. Iowa State and West Virginia are behind the likes of Oklahoma State and Kansas State in the league standing. So I don't know. We'll see. And then even TCU is sub 500. The only teams that are above 500 in the Big 12 right now are Kansas, Baylor, Texas Tech, and Texas. Everyone else is, uh, or at least projected to be sub 500 or is 500 in the league uh, at this moment there. So uh, keep uh, keep that in mind. Um, How about Penny Hart? We got to talk Memphis. Got to do it. Penny, so they win five in a row. No Monty Bates for the past three games. They end Houston's 37 game home winning streak. Uh, it's the first time Houston lost back to back games, period, since 2017. So, no, Memphis is not in the tournament right now. I don't think Memphis is sitting as a bubble team right now. If you look at that resume, not there. Getting there, not there. Okay. Jer- Jerry Palm and Joe Lenardi both disagree with you, by the way. They have them in the field? They have them like first four out. So, they don't have them in the field. That's right. But they have them as they a bubble team. They have them team. in the conversation. I, yeah. I, I, need, I need one more. Personally, I need one more to get there. What do they have next here? Memphis next at, C- at Cincinnati Man. Tuesday night. Win that. Okay, we're talking. Me for me, it was more about Houston losing and that kind of catching up with them. Now at twenty and four, um, I think because of Houston's resume, uh, just an oh by the way, uh, any hopes of Houston even getting to the two line, I think, are now gone completely. I think Houston can win out as a four loss team, and it still wouldn't land on the two line. I don't think I'll have the re- I don't think I'll have the wins, the top well, end wins. Here, here, here's the problem with Houston, and like I, I don't mean to to take away from Memphis's win, but Houston lost two of its top four players right before Christmas, um, most notably Marcus Sasser, and they just kept winning, so they kept moving up in the polls, and the computer number stayed strong, but they beat nobody. And over the past week, they've played two borderline NCAA tournament teams, which double as the two best teams they've played since they lost those players, and they lost both games. My, my point is, are we going to find out that losing two of your top four players matters a lot? And maybe Houston, um, maybe Houston just isn't quite as good as the ranking has suggested lately or even now. We'll see. Uh, there's that's that's certainly on the table. Um, at a certain point, maybe it just catches up with you, and that might be the case here. But a team that is, where does if you happen to know it, what about Rutgers? Where does Palm have them right now? Do you know? I do not know, okay. but I, I didn't see them as um, like not first four out or anything like that. Really? I think they still I, got I, Rutgers has a better resume right now than Memphis. I think that's not arguable. Rutgers won seventy three sixty five at Wisconsin. Rutgers has six quad one wins. They're, they're, they they have work to do, but Rutgers was among the biggest winners of the entire weekend. Uh, Rutgers has come on as of late to, to, to bring itself back to life. Now it's a it's weird because they're seventy eighth in Ken Palm. They got they have more work to do, but they've won against Michigan State tournament team, against Iowa, Ohio State tournament team, at Wisconsin tournament team. In addition to already having a win against Purdue. And they got a couple more road wins in there. They have more to do. Don't get me wrong. They got Illinois at home on Wednesday. Then they got to go at Purdue at Michigan. This could this could all disappear in an 
in a flash here for Steve Peichel's team, but they've at least put themselves for now in the conversation. They have to, I mean, they're unquestionably on the bubble because they have the high end wins. Now, are there some atrocious losses? They've lost at home to Lafayette, my man. They've got two quad three losses and a quad four loss. Yeah, now they they might be taking Alabama's mantle of having the weirdest resume though, because they've got I said again six quad one wins. At least they had six when it was Sunday when I checked. I don't know what the refresh adjusted any of that on Monday, but that was I name me a team that had a better weekend for its profile than Rutgers. I don't think there was one. Right? Well, Memphis. <laughs> I I, th- I still think Rutgers. I still think Rutgers winning at Wisconsin is bigger than winning at Houston. But yes, it's those two. Houston had won 37 straight games at home. It's true. Penny Hardway. No, I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily. I'm just saying that Rutgers had a great week. Like anytime you went at Wisconsin, you've done something great. Um, But man, that loss column is ugly. Two quadrant threes and a quadrant four. That's a, that's a, that's why Rutgers is still a little ways away from the cut line. Of, of being projected in the field of 68 right now because those losses are wild. But now they, had, they, they they've got they've had big wins at home all season. Um, now they've got a big win on the road too. So hey, how about this? There's a path for Rutgers to get an at-large bid, and I don't think many of us were speaking um, in those terms a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's my bad, by the way. I just. I, I should have known better with uh, with Penny. Stop disrespecting me, bro. <laughs> That's my bad. I'm sorry. I should I should have uh, I should have been better with that. Um, like there's a path. There's a path for Rutgers, and there's a path. Like we could tie these together. There's a okay. path for Rutgers in a way that didn't appear probable a few weeks ago, and there's now a path for Memphis um, in a way that didn't seem probable a few weeks ago. And I I tweeted this uh, the other on Saturday. You know, all of the discussion about Memphis in the preseason was about the five-star freshman. The reason when Memphis went from unranked, according to most, to ranked in the top 15, according to most, was because they added these two five-star freshmen, Jalen Dern and Monty Bates. Jalen Dern has been really good. Um, Amani Bates, not so much. Um, but the truth is the most important player at Memphis is not an 18-year-old freshman and not a projected NBA player. It's mm-hmm. a 25-year-old senior named DeAndre Williams. He was their best player, most important player last season, and he is that again. Memphis is 11 and four this season when DeAndre Williams plays with wins over Alabama and Houston. They're three and four without him with losses to East Carolina and Tulane. You could reasonably argue, and I know you can do this with other teams, but like forget all the other stuff at Memphis, all the other issues. If DeAndre Williams just stays healthy the entire season, you could argue Memphis is easily in the field right now. Yes, you can. There's definitely a scenario in which that's the case there. Uh, win at Cincinnati, and then we're, we're really talking. Um, I know you did the Jersey Mike segment on Friday. Uh, just a note that Oscar Sheboy has still got to be considered number one for National Player of the Year. He had 27-19. and 19. Kentucky won 78-57 uh, over Florida. So Sheboy is still number one as far as I'm concerned. Uh, quick quick thoughts on Purdue. Um, it beat well, Illinois, I mean, yeah. it beat, beat Illinois in dominant fashion six days ago. Then it got blown out at Michigan. Barely hung on against Maryland, produced 22 and four. And I, I, I'm still in on this team, but I just confounding sometimes, man. Well, we spent a lot of time on them on okay. Friday's podcast. And um, I think we even opened with them. And the point I made is a point that remains true. They are awesome offensively, they've got great individual talent. Matt Painter is terrific. But if your goal is to go to the Final Four for the first time since 1980, and if your goal or if your goal is to win the national championship, you teams with that guard like this just don't do it. They don't get there. Mm. Like I went through the last five Final Fours. There's no team that guards the way they guard that gets to the Final Four. Certainly doesn't. No team that wins the national championship. So that's a real concern. You know, I'm not saying it's impossible because anything's possible when you got Jaden Ivey and Zach Eady and Trevion Williams, but history says it's wildly unlikely that Purdue will get where it's trying to get unless it improves significantly on the defensive end. Right now, they're ranked 116th in the country in adjusted defensive efficiency, according to Ken Pa. Um, what, what that number tells us is that no matter what any other number attached to you says, 
what that number tells us is that you will likely, almost certainly, lose before the Final Four. Let's have a little fun thought experiment a week out, or week out, a month out from Selection Sunday. So we both think that Gonzaga and Arizona are going to be on the one line when we get there, so we're going to agree on that. Gonzaga and Arizona will be number one seeds on Selection Sunday. We both agree that. Who are going to be... We're going to be the other two, Parrish, because the the candidates would be Auburn, Kentucky, Baylor, Kansas, Purdue is five, Duke is six. That probably is it, right? Am I forgetting someone? I'm trying to look here. That might be it. Anyone else going to sneak up? Probably not. I Although so. uh, Wisconsin's high on quad one, quad two combined. They just lost to Rutgers. I don't know if that takes them out of the conversation. But let's just, just for fun. So, Gonzaga, Arizona, I will say, mm, I will say, I'm going to take your point about Auburn, and I'm going to stick with it. You said they could still have a case to have the best resume in the sport. Now, they don't have to go play at Kentucky. I will say Auburn is a one seed. If you win the Big 12, how are you not getting a one seed? Right. So I will say Gonzaga, Arizona, Auburn, Kansas are your one seeds a month from now on Selection Sunday. Would you agree or you want to swap out a team in there? I'll swap out a team. Okay. I'll go Gonzaga, Arizona, Kansas, because yeah, you win the Big 12, you're going to be a one seed. Gonzaga, Arizona, Kansas, Kentucky. How about this? Mm. Mm. No matter what happens Tuesday night in Knoxville. <sighs> Okay. I, was, okay. <laughs> I was about to get a little too far out of my skis. Yeah, 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 yeah. No How matter what happens. Kentucky will lose one more game in the regular season, win the SEC tournament, and be a one seed on Selection Sunday. That's my prediction on February 14th. Kentucky will lose one more game this regular season, and they'll win the SEC tournament and be a one seed. We've both got Gonzaga. We've both got Arizona. We've both got Kansas. I've got Auburn. You've got Kentucky. K- Kentucky does have at Tennessee, at Arkansas, at Florida remaining. That's tough. That's a little, yeah. No, it's, and it could, there's a, there's a scenario in which it's neither. And, you know, all the other teams I mentioned before are still conceivably there, but, um, yeah, man, that's gonna be that's gonna be a fun push, fun chase. I I think I I like a school with like Duke. I think Duke, twenty one and four, uh, you know, one at Boston College over the weekend, one at Clemson. I know you talked about that on the previous podcast. It's got Wake Forest at home on Tuesday night. Duke has at UVA, at Syracuse, at Pitt. Those are its remaining road games. Now it lost at home to Virginia just a week ago. There, I think Duke's gonna have to win out in the regular season, and then we'll see how things kind of another Duke loss. I think because of its opponents in the ACC, a Duke loss in the regular season probably knocks it out. I tell you this, Duke can't get to six losses and get a one seed. Not going to happen. One, a five loss Duke team can get there, but it's not, it's going to have to rely on uh, movement elsewhere, um, which would be intriguing because in most seasons you might say a, a, a Duke team with five losses is like an automatic or a one seed. And I would agree with you in most seasons that would be the case, but I don't know about this season, but I think there's still a lot of teams still alive for it. And that's what makes it fun. That's why I wanted to, uh, to, uh, and, to drop that on. And, and, and Providence, I don't think Providence will get there, but Providence, I believe, is now ten and two in the first two quadrants. I know. I, I, I you like know the, res- the resume. The yeah. strong. The computer number is not as much, uh, in part because they play so many. A lot of their wins are very close, and their two losses are blowouts. I mean, I I, get, I just sort of laugh when I see people uh, confused about why Providence computer numbers aren't what they think they should be. It's like not some mystery. They they win a lot of close games. And they, their two losses are blowout losses. That's the explanation. It's not that hard to figure out. They're nine and zero in games decided by five or fewer points. And I sort of made this point on Saturday. Like I get that there's got to be a luck element to that. I, I get that it, it, there's got to be a luck element in there somewhere. But I think it's got more to do with Ed Cooley and his team than just luck. Um, you know, again, you. It, you, you can't win a national championship it you know with rare exceptions without getting lucky somewhere along the way all right like luck plays a part in this stuff mm-hmm. um if you ask a coach who's won a national title what's what's the most important thing that has to happen for you to do that 
what they'll tell you is you got to be really, really, really good. And you got to be really, really, really fortunate. Th- those are the two things that are, you know, I remember talking to Billy Donovan about it. He was like, you know, if this shot doesn't go in, in this game, then we're eliminated in the second round. You know, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not usually enough to just be a great team. You have to be a great team that, you know, the, the breaks go your way. Um, so there is a luck element, but I refuse to just chalk up what's happening at Providence right now in these close games to luck. I just, I, to, to, to chalk it up to that is to be dismissive mm-hmm. of, of the role a coach plays in those moments of the role players play in those moments of the role of, uh, 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 that pressure and calmness play uh the 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 role those things have in those moments like you can't no athlete will tell you that some people don't perform better under pressure than others that some people aren't calmer and cooler in pressure situations than others and providence seems to be an excellent example of that so if you want to say that they've been fortunate in some cases fine but chalking what they're doing up to just luck that's that's wild to me because it's not I don't think it's an accurate reflection of what's happening there. I will say I should have put Providence in initially. And if the Friars have three losses on selection Sunday, they are going to have a great case for a one seed with three or right, two now. If they have three, no matter how they get there, they'll have a really good case. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh just a couple more notes to wrap it up before we preview Tuesday. Um do want to note Miami won at Wake Forest in an important bubble game. I think that was actually one of the bigger bubble results of the weekend with the Canes going into Wake. Those are a couple of bubble level teams and uh, Jim Laranaga's group getting a win there. Davidson lost at, uh, at Rhode Island. Uh, Davidson's still in the field, but, you know, something for the A-10. And then your longest winning streaks in the country right now, Gonzaga, South Dakota State, Murray State, Vermont, all sitting at 14 in a row. Um, good group there. Uh, last one. Illinois State Athletic Director Kyle Brennan announced an hour before the Super Bowl that Dan Muller will be uh, let go, fired, however you want to term it, at the end of the season. He's going to coach the Redbirds through the end of the season. He's been there a decade, and there were rumblings about this a year ago. But uh, but yes, we will have another opening, this one in the MVC, with Illinois uh, State. All right, as for Monday, Tuesday, Paris. Monday, we're, we're good. It's a light slate. Valentine's Day. Love how this, I mean, listen, you know, I, I can't get, I can't get fired up over Wazoo at Oregon, West Virginia, Kansas state, Dayton, URI. These are solid matchups, but there's not, a, there's not a game of like true national urgency, relevance, intrigue. So you kind of get Monday off to a certain extent. If you're a fan of any of these teams, obviously you could be locked in, but you know, Valentine's night might be a little bit open. Nothing wrong with that on Tuesday. My man took one trip to CVS and now he's fired up and ready to go tonight. I'm I'm just mentioning how it is. Parish horny as always. Come on, can we can we continue on through the show? Here is a video. I, I'm not the one who thought I got hit on this morning at CVS. Hey, I I was not I was not doing the hitting. I was the hitty. Here we go. <laughs> mm. I Off guess I just don't assume every time somebody speaks to me that they're hitting on me. You've got a woman in her, I would assume, early 30s. Okay, deadly. Doing this idol up at the CVS card you know, station, Hallmark, whatever. Are you getting anything for anyone? What kind of question is that? Well, that am is, I buying it for myself here? <laughs> that is am a I weird... buying a card for myself? I can acknowledge it's a weird question. Come on now. I would I would go so far as to say it's even weird to even talk to another human in CVS. I have agree. You, That's what I'm saying. Have you ever talked to another customer in CVS? I don't, don't think, think I that, ever have. Don't think that's ever happened. Justified in my curiosity, that's all. All right, so Tuesday night. Oh, oh, oh we are loaded. Loaded. Like the, all right. Only thing I'm going to say oh. to you at CVS is, like, where's the Drano? Can you show me where the Drano is? <laughs> hey, life tip here. Don't pour Drano down your toilet. Oh, boy. Doesn't work. Yeah. No good, huh? It Recent said, development in the Parish household? Yeah, it actually, it's so frustrating. Toilet was having problems because I, I flushed candle wax down it. I dumped candle wax. All right, yeah. yeah. Was that not smart? This is With why you don't get hit on at convenience stores or drug stores or whatever. I had a candle issue in my office. And so then I had to scrape off all the candle wax. And then I, rather than just throw it in the garbage, <laughs> oh rather than throw it in the garbage, I just dumped yeah. it in the toilet. I don't know why. Yeah. 
So then I had a problem. I went to Walgreens. What were you using the candle wax for, by the way? I was really just lighting. <laughs> I just, had a, just had a candle lit my office, just like the okay. way it smelled. Coconut. So. I like the way coconut smells. It's had a coconut candle. And uh, and I left it the I left it on all night and then it overflowed and I had wax all over a shelf. So I had to scrape that up. And then I rather than dump it in the garbage, I dumped it in the toilet. And then I was like, well, I, clearly the drain is clogged up. I'll go get Drano. And so I went to Walgreens, got a big bottle of Drano, poured it in. And then after I poured it in, read the directions, actually says on the bottle, do not use this on the toilet. <laughs> it, it says it right there. Unbelievable. But yeah, we'll go with uh, we'll go with your first story with the candle wax. Mm -hmm. Tuesday night, I will be in Providence. No, at, at Providence. At the dunk. At the dunk. Supremely excited for this. Eight o'clock Eastern CBS Sports Network. Biggest game of the night. Nova at Providence, biggest game of the regular season in the Big East here. Uh, first place in the Big East could uh, could hang in the balance. And yes, Providence's um, case to eventually be a one seed could uh, could depend on this as well. And I cannot wait to uh, to get there and and just that place is going to be on fire, complete disaster zone in all of the best ways. Providence fans are going to show up in a huge way, and uh, I cannot wait for that one. So that is the biggest one on Tuesday night. We will talk about it Wednesday morning. Um, I think we're going to podcast at 10 a.m. Wednesday, but there's a slight chance I might need to do something work-related, but the plan will be to podcast at 10 a.m. I'm going to try and do it. I, I, by the way, I'm so in favor of pushing that to 11 a.m. Okay, I, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do it at 11 instead of 10. I got to figure out all that stuff offline. I, I, I but I, I think I, I know, I know, I know. You're in favor. I got you. I got you. But well, for, I mean, forever. I, I got I'm you. I'm so got tired you. on Wednesdays. <laughs> I don't go to bed till after 4 a.m. Okay. I stay up playing Wordle. Oh boy. Um, tricky, tricky one today. Did you do it? No, no spoilers. I haven't had time. Uh, uh, I, and I, I miss Sunday too. A little bit, a little bit tricky. Uh. Can't remember yesterday's, but Monday's little challenge right there, little little bit of a challenge. That's all I'm gonna say. New York Times took over Wordle. Nothing. It's, it's going that New York Times direction. Not, not nothing's a challenge for me on Wordle. I get them all right all the time, every okay. time without over, exception. No cheating. I'm saying over under four point five guesses, and you're the over. I'm saying. I mean, probably, can... probably, but I get it right every time. I'm, 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 I can get. I've gotten it in as few as two. Obviously, as many as six. I'd say my average is four or five. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, elsewhere on Tuesday night. I said, where's your Drano? And it turns out I didn't even need Drano. It was not going to help me at all. Nope. I, I took a trip to the store and wasted money on something I didn't need at all. Nope. Because you poured candle wax down the toilet. What are we doing here? What am, Texas, what am I doing? <laughs> Texas at Oklahoma is a 7 Eastern tip. Wake Forest at Duke. Is a 7 Eastern tip. A little intrigue there. Memphis at Cincinnati. The aforementioned Tigers-Bearcats game. Big one at 7 Eastern. And then, yes, 8 o'clock, Nova at Providence. And then the 9 o'clock slate is Kentucky at Tennessee. And then you've got Wisconsin at Indiana. And you've got Iowa State at TCU. Uh, some intrigue on the bubble level in the Big 12 as well. Tuesday is stacked, man. We got a really, really good Tuesday. Plenty we'll be able to get to on Wednesday, but, uh, but Nova Providence is, is the big time spot here for, uh, for the big East nationally, all that stuff. Can't just, I haven't been to a well, the last game I went to last game I went to, I think was St. John's Kansas at the Islanders arena on Long Island. I think that was a lot. And that was the first week of December. I think that was in before like Omicron really came in with the force. I think that was the last time I was at a game. So it's been, uh, it's been two, almost two and a half months here. So I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Can't wait to get there. And hopefully we get, we get a really good one because did you, I mean, with that DePaul game with Providence, man, they get to overtime, man, DePaul, DePaul fans. I feel for you. Cause you've been, you've been, you've just been, you've been in the, in the SHIT for just decades at this they're, point. They're, they're competing though. They, I, I know they're competing and they should have had the game. They should have had it. Didn't know. And then Providence pulls it out, and it's just a madhouse, man. It's just, the dunk is one of the better environments on all of uh, in all of college basketball. So that's going to be a well, it's going to be a great game, I think. Although Nova's been pretty solid as of late, I you know I can see a situation in which Villanova goes into that and kind of 
you know, lays it down. They, they got a good fight from Seton Hall, but prior to that, um, they held on late against St. John's. They beat UConn. They've won six of their past seven there. I'll be interested to see if Nova really shows up and sends a message or if Providence can, I mean, if Providence beats Villanova, then forget about it. Right. And the big East is theirs for the first time ever. Never won a regular season championship. There's, we're getting a little bit of, um, and I don't have all the information on this, but Providence is not scheduled to play a full slate in Big East play. And so there's already some skeptics over whether it should be considered a true regular season champion if it gets to that point. But you beat Villanova at home. They'll get the return game on March 1st. Villanova will host Providence. So I think it's all going to shake out as it probably should. But yeah, man, I'm pumped. That's your Tuesday night slate. We got plenty to get to, but uh, I think the one over in Rhode Island is the biggest one of the night. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Austin Mills, legend. Shouts to Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast in the middle of the dumbest pandemic of my lifetime. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Five stars. Leave a nice review at Apple Podcasts. More of us than there are of them. Please, if you haven't subscribed yet to the YouTube channel, knock that out. It helps us. And uh, while you're here, before you leave, uh, if you hadn't already smashed the like button, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. That dude risked a trip to the Final Four just to smash. It's Valentine's Day. You're not risking anything. We have no idea when we'll talk to you again. Is that accurate assessment of things right now? The plan is Wednesday at 10 a.m. I think that's going to be when it should be. I just have to make sure, you know, working on maybe something else. I don't want to give uh give up when who who the interview might be with but uh um, so secretive yeah you know what do you, what do you want from me so um yeah wednesday 10 a.m i think that's probably when it's going to be that's just going to completely ignore the fact that i said i would love to push these things to 11 a.m you need to talk to our bosses about that it is not my decision nobody talks to me i didn't even know we didn't have video today <laughs> <laughs> you want to cue that up one more time before we end the show? <laughs> that was a great moment. That's no, that is why I love live. That's why I love it. You just never know what you're going to get. I just so badly wanted a word from one of our sponsors. I was begging for it practically. Uh, we'll talk to you on Wednesday. Till then, take care.